My name is Doug Epperson. I'm one of the public information officers with the Oregon Incident Management Team Number One. Uh, we're in unified command here. This is uh, Chris Arnold. He's with my counterpart on the Oregon State Fire Marshal side, and want to welcome you all for coming. Um, what we're going to do is have some people talk today. And we're going to start out with the initial attack on when the fire first started and what was done then. Work our way through the state fire marshal's office, which were the next ones to come. Then our incident management team, which came. And then we're also going to talk about how we, uh, how we plan on taking care of this before it's uh, all over. And then we'll talk about the evacuation levels. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Lionel Smith. I was the initial attack I see on this thing. It was about 11 o'clock. Uh, we got a call about a tone out over the radio that there was a fall, small brush fire up on uh, by the Mill Creek Bridge. And as we got up on top, there was, uh, there was one here on 100 on top. And from there all the way to uh, 92, they were all there was, I think, nine fires. The wind came in about 11.30 that, that morning and it picked up and these fires just took off. Um, there you go, Jamar. Well, like you said, uh, the initial call was by a high bridge. Uh, not knowing what the call was, so when we got up there, like I said, once we hit highway, or mile post 99, we came up on the first fire. We also had an engine on it. That was sitting at the top of the grade. So once I noticed there was an engine there, we looked up, noticed there was more columns going as we were going up the road. So my next one was probably mile post 97. As we were going up, we also had engines coming up. So what we did is we had an engine there and then looked up again and we noticed more smoke. So between 97 and 96, I noticed that the cowboy crew had already jumped on this one, so I just told them to keep doing what you're doing. Once we got an engine there, they would start assisting them and then try to get what we had out. Those are those ones going back to 97. 97 was probably the, or 90, 99 was probably one of the bigger ones so far. I was actually putting that one at about five acres. So mile post 99, five acres, 97, half an acre and then 96, I'm gonna say that one was probably about a tenth of an acre. Looked up again, I talked with, I got in contact with one of the cowboy crews and they said, yeah, there, there was still more fires down the road. So getting past county line, I'm gonna say between 96 and 94, we had another fire that was just past county line. I was actually putting that one at about 20 acres, north, northwest winds pushing it towards the subdivision of, of uh, county line. We already had a 750 there, so I said, go ahead and do what you can with what you got. And when, as we were getting resources, we would start prioritizing where we were gonna put them. So 99 and between 94 and 97 was our priorities at that moment. Moving on, 94, at 94 we had actually had two fires. One that was on the north side of the road and one that was on the south side of the road. So those two were both active, so at that time, that one came to priority because there was two fires right there. As we moved on, I drove all the way up to uh, the Garen Ranch. Fire and safety was there, so I figured, okay, we'll put fire and safety in charge of that one since they pretty much had everybody else there. Me and Lionel went and concentrated ourselves back on um, in between 94, 94 and 93 since I had pretty much put that one as a priority fire. We were kind of limited on what we had. So we actually had all engines, all resources that we had in the agency were actually on this fire, doing what we can with it. And like I said, just the winds had picked up and it just started proceeding. Two of the fires actually came together and that would be 96 and in between 90, or 93 and 94. Those two fires actually came together. They were starting to move towards the subdivision. So kind of what I had everybody do is just fall back and we kind of went into a defensive mode and started working with the subdivisions, everything along highway to our, on County Line Road. So, like I said, the fires were starting to go to weather, the winds were picking up. Went into a defensive mode, we started uh, prepping the houses for burnout. Uh, other than that, it's like I said, everything just kind of all came together and fires started getting bigger. 
in between uh, 94, we had the one on the south side. That one started growing up, and the, the problem we were having with that one with our northwest winds, every time we would think we had these ones corralled, that one would pick up, blow across the road, and start throwing more fires on us. So it was just one of those things where get what you can and do with what, with what you had. And like I said, we, we tried to do with what we had. Uh, the one on the south side, that one actually picked up and that one actually made a run on us. And by that time we were starting to get into the uh, afternoon winds where the winds were changing, pushing towards the agency. So now all of our fires were actually pushing towards the agency, towards all of the subdivision. So on both sides of the road, like I said, we just went into a defensive mode and started protecting homes and diverting, trying to divert all fires away from homes until we can get it out into range land. This kind of set the situation for you guys. The way the conditions were set this year was uh, for large fire potential. Um, and that started back in early June, uh, which we were probably at least a month and a half, month and a half ahead of schedule. Um, normally our fire season starts in June or July, but this year started probably mid-May. So, and, and if you understand climate change, it, it'll kind of speak for itself. Um, the other thing that's going on, I wish we had a map, but uh, we're not the only fire in the Northwest. Um, just to give you guys kind of an update, Nest First Nation, um, they got four or three teams on it. They've lost 44 structures. Um, Colville, I believe, doesn't even have an incident management team. That's how strapped it is for the nation. There is no resources around at all. Um, we're lucky to have what we got here. Um, right now, nationally, there are, they are trying to uh, prioritize fires. Uh, right now, structures are the, are the place where priority is happening. Um, it's an unfortunate Yakima has a large fire over there. It's all in timber. Um, they're actually getting resources pulled off of it because there's so many homes being destroyed and burned. Um, it's just it's just something that's happened. These conditions have been setting up um, all year long with the with no snowpack this year for the reservation. It's, it's just been a struggle for us. It's, it's been kind of nerve wracking for us. So, um, you know, like these guys said, as we progressed down the highway, we had enough resources to put one apparatus at each fire. And as these things were growing, um, you can only do so much. Um, we talk about firefighter safety all the time and firefighter exposure to the fire. Um, if you only got one engine, there's only so much you can do. And as we progress with this, there was a decision made by Jabbar and, and Lionel to, we have to back off, we have to regroup, we gotta worry about people's homes. Incident Commander of the Oregon State Fire Marshal's Blue Team, Scott Majors. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to just talk to you today. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to serve you. Um, I want to start this conversation off with, with uh, one thing that I know and I know well. I understand a little bit about fire after 35 years of doing this. And when I arrived on Thursday morning at 6.30 because we were called Wednesday evening around 8 to activate our team. My team represents um, about 40 people. Um, that were brought in as an incident management team. Not all of them were able to come because there too are spread thin throughout the state. Uh, we came in and our sole mission, our number one priority when we arrived was to protect you and your structures. And that's not something we take lightly. But I want to point out, it wasn't just us that did it. Your fire, your police, and all of those men and women that served for you long before we got here did far more work than we were able to do. You owe them a debt of gratitude. They made our job easier. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you, it was a tough job. It was a tough job. When we arrived here, I met this gentleman on the end, John and, and Trey, and I gotta tell you, Trey knows more about fire than anybody I've ever met in my life. He told me that day exactly what the fire was to do. And you know what? We listened to him, and we were able to get ahead of it and do what we needed to do. These two gentlemen asked me to protect their community, asked our teams to come in and do what we can. And that's exactly what we did. And I work 
not for the state fire marshal right now, but for you all. So when we arrived, we met them. They told us what they wanted. They gave me the objective. This is what you're to do. Protect our houses, protect our lives, and take care of us. That's exactly what we did. In the heat of the battle, you had about 17, there were 17 different fire departments here, representing seven counties in the state of Oregon, for about 125 men and women and their equipment to do that. And we had a daunting task. We knew that this was a big fire. We knew the potential of this fire. And we wanted to get out ahead of it on Thursday morning. So when we got here, we, got, we regrouped. We called in the resources we need. It took a while to get all of those people here to move them across the state. And once we got them here, we put together a plan that would best fit the situation. But the one thing we knew was going to happen was the situation was going to change hourly. We had a short period of time in the morning to figure out what all of this looked like. We're not from here. So I had to send them out there and say, tell me what's going on so we could put together a plan. And we knew that on Thursday the winds were going to be difficult, that they were going to come up more. And I, I used to work in Redmond, right down the road. I understand Central Oregon winds. They come up every afternoon, and I expected that. Didn't expect these, but I knew they were going to come up. Early in the afternoon, I had reports, and I had, I had put people all through this area, these subdivisions. I wanted to protect these subdivisions over here, and we wanted to get up here to the head of the fire. There was houses and property up there we were concerned about. I was getting reports that up here on the north end of the fire, it was starting to push and was pushing hard, um, and it was moving across and up 26, and we were worried about this drainage area, this, this canyon area, that was, if it would jump, and it did, and we were, we were after that with the help of, of Trey's team, and we were, we were after that. And we were, we were getting ahead of it. We weren't really getting ahead of it, but we were dealing with it, and then the winds changed. I got a big issue over here, and I knew that I had a whole bunch of property over here that I needed to protect, so we switched everybody over to this side. Now we're moving on to about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm moving all those resources from one side to the other, leaving something here so I can continue doing work. So the resources go to the other side of the fire. We hit that head on. I was at, at about five o'clock, I had to go up to a meeting to meet um, Sean and his team because I knew they were coming in. And I get reports from my deputy, incident commander says, you need to get back here. The wind's changed again. That's when we were, that's when we were, we knew we had a fight on our hands. The wind's changed, it came right back this way, right towards our command post. We had set up in, in Trey's office and we had all of our equipment there. They were out in front, so we moved all those that, that, that fire apparatus back along Holiday and those subdivisions. And that's where we stood and that's where we fought the fire. I will tell you, at 5.30 to about 10 o'clock, men and women were standing between your houses and the fire, moving it around. I'm sorry I lost one structure. Kills me. But you know what? I didn't lose a life. Everybody's, everybody's okay. Number one goal on this chart right here is make sure that us and you are okay. I lived up to that gentleman's re request of it. Okay? They worked hard. And we worked right behind and right beside these gentlemen and the, and the team they did. They had. Um, I'm not telling you. I was standing in front of, in front of uh, the office there looking at this and, and scratching my head thinking, geez, I got a job here, huh? Um, I was a little nervous, I'm not going to lie to you. I was worried for a while, but I knew that we had the right people at the right place at the right time to fix the problem, and that we were going to take care of this. I had made a promise and I wasn't going to let it down. Fortunately, the relief I had came the next day. The, 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 other, team were, the other team came in, um, Sean's Type 2 team came in, the Oregon Type, uh, the Oregon number one team came in, and we were able to work together, and the synergistic effect of us working together made us that much stronger. And um, we got ahead of this thing, and I think we've been doing some really good work. And I'm going to turn it over to Sean here in a moment, and let him tell you what he took it, um, and what we've taken it from the next day forward, and what we've continued to try to do to make it, this work out right. I'm, not, I'm telling you, I'm still concerned about a few areas. I was taught a long time ago that the incident commander is the first one to always believe the fire is burning, the last one to believe the fire is out. I've held true to that for a long time. And with that philosophy, it makes sure that, that I can protect everybody here I'm responsible for. 
So again, thank you. I am sorry to meet you under these circumstances. I truly am. But I'm proud to be able to serve you. Now I'd like to introduce Oregon Incident Management Team Number One Incident Commander Sean Sheldon. Uh, good afternoon, Sean Sheldon. I see you with Oregon Team One, and I'll accept that applause on their behalf and on the behalf of all those firefighters out there doing their job to help take care of your lands. And I appreciate what they're doing. Uh, when we got here. I'm sure John and Bobby and Trey were like going, oh gosh, here's Sean again. This is my seventh time in the last probably 15 years that I've been blessed to come uh, fight fire, your nightmare having us here. Um, but I do come with a little bit of knowledge of the grounds here. Um, talking with uh, John and Bobby and Trey we, and working with Scott, we developed our objectives and we hold true to those objectives. And we have an obligation to each and every one of you and to our firefighters out on the ground to meet that first objective, which is firefighter and public safety. And so every action we take out there is based on keeping you guys and those firefighters safe. Our second one, once we all got in place, and it goes hand in hand with that first one, is to provide structure protection. And it's always best to um, provide that protection by trying to keep that fire from getting anywhere near that house or that structure or the infrastructure or the businesses uh, that you guys rely, rely on. Uh, working hand in hand with Scott, we were able to meld our resources together, working with some different tactics to try to keep that fire farther away from those homes um, as possible. In all cases, that didn't work, but we were able to, as Scott said, keep that fire from impacting those homes in, in adverse ways. Um, our th second thing is what, what Scott and his team primarily does is uh, structure triage, and, and that's talking about looking out, out in front of the fire at those structures what are we going to need to help make those homes safe? And if we could do it, we'll make them safe before uh, the fire has an opportunity to um, impinge on those structures. Uh, another key one is to have minimum impacts on the ground out there. And so whatever we do, whether we're working in the, in the valuable waters that you have here, we want to think about that resource, the timber resource, and we're going to do everything we can to keep the footprint of this fire as small as possible. With that said, we're still adhering to that safety rule. Um, we really take uh, heart with the archaeological and cultural resources, the historic uh, resources out there, and we're working hand in hand with your guys' resource advisors to help us uh, meet those objectives that were set. Um, and then last but not least would be performing any of the damage assessments uh, that was created by this fire. So with that said, when I got here, um, the fire had already, um, we'd had our meeting, and at the time we were here, it was impacting the area where we were going to set up our fire camp. And with the help of a bunch of resources, we were able to take fire around that area where we were going to set our camp up kept everybody safe and did not lose any structures in that event. Um, with that said, I'll go into where we are currently and where we hope to be um, going into this in the future. And so we've set this fire up into branches. Everything to the west side of Highway 26 is branch one. It has two divisions on that and that's the way we break up the geographic area. Division Alpha, which is just right outside of um, you can see it from the parking lot, the Tenino Road. Uh, got good, good job the last couple nights putting dozer line and structure protection all along the homes along Tenino Road. Using firing operations and dozer operations, they were able to keep the fire from coming down and impacting uh, those homes in that general area. Uh, currently, they are working towards the Shatike drainage 
it's a timber drainage. It's, it hasn't had a lot of fire history in there, so there is a large abundant uh, amount of fuels in that drainage. It's a steep drainage. It's hard to get through that drainage, and that's where our trouble area is that we're really focusing a lot of efforts in right now to try to find a way to get across that drainage and, and get a foothold around this piece of the fire. Moving up into D Division Charlie, they're working the same way, trying to tie um, into Division Alpha um, in that Shatike drainage. We're looking really good along the rest of that division with dozer lines and hand crews and engines uh, working hand in hand to try to get that together. Uh, the areas that you see that have the black on it, those are pieces of ground that we feel really confident that the fire is not going to uh, jump out of those boundaries that we're calling that piece uh, contained. Um, as we come around into Mill Creek drainage and to the Warm Creek or Warm Springs River drainage, uh, the fire is pretty much held um, to the west side slopes of those drainage, has not got up into um, the area that's called the island. Um, the fire we're trying to, it's a hard piece down there, you guys are all familiar with Beaver Creek, it's really tough to get across that drainage and the crews are out there currently uh, making really good progress right now, uh, getting across that drainage and holding the fire um, from getting any farther established up on Schooley Flats or up onto the island and it's sounding like they're really making good progress today. As we come around, we did some firing operations yesterday from uh, the Eagle Book Butte Lookout um, down to Warm Springs River drainage there in the bottom. That all held really well and have, has proceeded to um, kind of go out. It ran into a lot of rocky uh, uh, lack of fuel area and with a good humidity recovery we had last night and crews going up in there, we were able to kind of stop the progress of the fire. Um, and, and avoid any impacts to the hatchery that's uh, down there in, in Warm Springs River. So that's kind of the gist of where, we're, where we were and, and where we're going is, the, like I said, our big focus is on the type drainage over here at the Division uh, Charlie Alpha Break. Um, we're hoping we could get across that and today or tomorrow we're doing a, a lot of hard work. We've thrown a lot of resources into that.